Hi there, Todd Candle on here. Very glad to be spending the next half hour or so with you. Uh, as I often uh, do, I have a question for you right off the top. Do you like to be surprised? <laughs> I like to be surprised a lot. Like I really enjoy surprises. In fact, I enjoy surprises so much that um, I am almost impossible to surprise because <laughs> I have quite the imagination. And so um, when I'm planning surprises for people, um, I tend to be fairly elaborate in terms of uh, the lengths I go to make sure that they are actually surprised and actually thrilled with the end result. So when someone is trying to surprise me, um, if I get even the slightest hint or if I have the slightest expectation that a surprise uh, is imminent or should be in the cards, I start planning uh, my surprise as if I was in charge of uh, making it happen. And <laughs> sadly, sometimes I'm often six or seven steps down the road with my flights of fancy. And uh, as a result, rarely does the surprise, as it actually uh, turns out, um, surprise me in the way in which I would have surprised myself because I love surprises. Um, what's really sad about this is that my wife really doesn't like surprises. And so um, we found ourselves throughout our marriage um, several times in situations where I have gone to great lengths to surprise her. Um, most recently, it was with buying her her current vehicle. I didn't tell her about it. I set it all up. It was. I went to huge lengths to, you know, just one evening I picked them up and pretended I was on a drive and we showed up and I said, surprise, here's your new truck. And she was not impressed. Uh, in fact, I dare say she was horrified. She hates surprises. So how do I, a guy who loves surprises, um, learn to stop surprising my, she, my wife? She, she wants to plan. Right? So if I ever dare think of a trip, it's, she's just not the kind of woman that you can show up to with two tickets and say, surprise, we're going to Europe. She would hate that because she would want the months and months and months of lead up to plan and to get excited about it. Um, there were a couple times where um, she was surprised and pleased and those dovetailed with uh, me in terms of my favorite surprises. Uh, I would say my three favorite surprises in my life were the birth of my first three kids. Uh, the reason our fourth child, baby Zoe, isn't on that list is because we weren't surprised about her arrival. My wife prevailed upon me after three kids uh, and she found out <laughs> what she was having. With the first three, my um, preference uh, ruled the day and we didn't find out what we were having. So our first baby was Jordan, a son, and I was thrilled as a father to have a firstborn son. And then naturally, after you have a son, you really hope to have a girl. And so when it came time for our second born uh, to arrive, we were collectively holding our breath. My wife was not happy about not knowing, but I was able to uh, keep her in the game. And when our baby daughter, Sarah, showed up and we could tell it was a girl, I will never forget uh, Nikki squealing with delight. It's a girl, it's a girl, it's a girl, it's a girl. She was 100% thrilled. Um, so those were two of my greatest surprises when my third child a second son was born, I thought, this is great. Two boys. And then, of course, we found out that Zoe was a girl, and we thought, we have the perfect family. Uh, it's a great, great surprise. Sometimes you need a surprise. Sometimes uh, your life is at the point where only a surprise will save you. Um, this is that time when you've kind of done everything you can to set yourself up to succeed, and there's really nothing more that you can do to uh, change the circumstances of your life. That uh, tipping point that you're waiting for is really just going to have to come out of left field. Can you identify? Have you ever been there? Um, I'm there right now. I've been there several times in my life. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. I get to feeling a little bit like my wife in those times. I would much prefer if I could just successfully plan my life and uh, walk it out without any hiccups. But um, sad but true. Life typically doesn't go as planned, and especially when you're trying to uh, live outside the boundaries of what's considered normal, or if you're trying to achieve something um, superlative or unique or extraordinary with your life, um, you're going to find yourself there for sure. So if that's you, if you're trying to do something abnormal with your life and you find yourself waiting for the tipping point and knowing that you can't do anything to make it happen, um, you may need a surprise. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the things that will be happening if the book of Ruth is uh, you know, meant as an instructional pattern for us, which I believe it is, uh, we're going to explore some of the things that will be happening when a good surprise is on its way.
Okay, so we're going to explore the things that will, that definitely will be happening when a good surprise is on its way. The idea here is to help you, by this sermon, um, to watch for and cultivate those conditions. Cool, right? This is uh, Ruth chapter 4. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none <coughs> but you to redeem it, and I am next to you. And he said, Sure, I'll, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz plays his trump card. On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Bum, bum, bum. The field comes with a new wife. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. He's going to dilute his inheritance by having more than one uh, firstborn son. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, get this, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. <laughs> so here, take my shoe. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate his name, <clears throat> to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house, like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. The Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. We'll finish the uh, rest of chapter 4 um, next week. What I want to do today is uh, zero in on uh, verses 11 and 12. So uh, let's take a look at those verses together. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house, like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. We're going to focus exclusively today on those two verses, verses 11 and 12. So what's just happened? Boaz has talked. There's one relative closer than him. He wants to marry Ruth. We've followed their romance over the previous weeks. He wants to marry this young woman. Uh, there's one problem. There's a relative closer than him. So he kind of busts a move on this guy. He uh, sets the hook with, uh, there's a field to buy. He's like, sure, I'll buy the field. Ah, but a woman comes with it. And uh, he probably knew that this guy was not going to want to add a wife to his family. And the guy predictably says, no, no, thank you. You do it. So Boaz um, kind of busts his move there and uh, gets Ruth. So he uh, negotiates the matter. And then he does the deal. And he calls uh, all the men at the gate and the elders who are there as witnesses. I want to point out before I uh, start walking through the sermon in earnest for you that Ruth isn't there. Okay, remember, she's at home with Naomi. Naomi says, stay home and see how the matter will unfold. Ruth is not there. Like you, perhaps, she is still waiting to see how things will turn out. <laughs> Can you identify? Do you feel like you're still waiting to see how things are going to turn out? Um, me too. I just want to say, uh, in light of this, thankfully I get to point out that uncertainty is normative. Okay? Uncertainty is normative. You will find yourself throughout your life, um, time and time and time again, in situations where you just don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, that's me. That's you. <laughs> if uh, you happen to be in a season where uncertainty is not the name of the game, just enjoy it. Thank God for it. But don't expect like it's going to stay that way forever. Uh, you're not the only one. All right? If uncertainty is um, the way you're living your life right now, that is uh, very normative. And what's great about today's sermon is that Ruth is about to get some very, very good news. Uh, the best kind of surprise. Uh, of course, it's not really a surprise. Her relationship with Boaz has been developing over the course of the book, but uh, for our purposes today, uh, this is the best kind of news. She is going to get a new husband. I find it really encouraging that in 
all of the positive Bible stories I can think of, uh, and I mean Bible stories that are dealing with a character, with a person, um, in the happy stories, usually the key to those stories, hear this, is the character receiving the desires of their heart or the desire of their heart time and time and time and time again. Uh, we have mothers who were barren who get a son. We have men who have no inheritance who receive one. Um, these characters who are missing something, they have a dramatic need to borrow a, a line from screenwriting and uh, through the course of the story their dramatic need, the desire of their heart uh, is given them by God. Today I just want to say that I want to start believing more than I have so far that that is possible for me. Um, and I want to believe and hope the same thing for you. And I want to encourage you to begin believing that uh, you are a character in God's story and that uh, as the story unfolds, He is going to give you the desire of your heart. So here are those uh, conditions to watch for and cultivate that I promised you. Uh, verse 11, and all the people who were at the gate. Uh, let me highlight the word all, all the people who were at the gate. Um, I believe that no words in the Bible are there by accident, and so um, when a word like all is there, it's meant to tell us that everyone was in agreement. There was unanimity. There was agreement amongst the people who were at the gate. Um, let me draw out the following point from that. Uh, here it is. <laughs> Nothing happens in life unless more than one person agrees. Do you agree? You'll know this from experience, right? Anytime you want to do anything significant with your life, nothing happens unless more than one person agrees. If it's just one person, it's just one person. Like, you can't build a movement with just you. It's just you. Um, but once you start getting people to agree with you, well, then you're starting to get some momentum. This really is a, a, criti a critical mass question. It's a momentum question. This is a momentum thing, right? Nothing happens unless more than one person agrees. This is something that you can watch for. Um, as you are seeking to build your life. Um, you will sense momentum. Momentum is sometimes intangible. It's something you can sense. You just have a feel for it. Um, you can also see it building um, as more and more people agree with you. Depending on your industry, this is going to look different. If you're in sales, um, you'll see it as you begin to sell more and more product. If you work with people, say you're a teacher, you'll begin to see momentum as your kids begin to react and respond. Yes, their grades are going to go up, but more than that, you'll see a facility with the uh, subject matter. You'll see a confidence that begins to be born in them. Um, if you're looking for progress in your marriage, this is a little bit more intangible. You and your wife, or you and your husband, you're just going to you're going to feel happier, you're going to connect more, uh, you'll, you'll be smiling more, you'll be less tense all the time. So sometimes, depending on uh, what you're doing, uh, momentum can be tangible. Other times, it's a little bit less so. But um, you'll know it when you see it. And here's the uh, admonition for you when it comes to momentum. When you see it, build on it. Okay? When you see that you're starting to get a response, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, the hardest thing with building momentum is working when you have no sense of momentum. Uh, you've just started something and you have no result. That's when it's really depressing. My wife talks about this all the time with her personal training clients. Uh, she says the hardest time is in the first, I think she says, eight weeks or so when people start a program uh, and they don't see any results and they just got to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, once you start to see results, then um, exercise can become a joy. So take that and apply it to other areas of your life. Keep doing what you're doing until you begin to get to see momentum. Once momentum uh, starts, keep pushing. When you see it, build on it. Um, and then when it's missing, okay, um, now I mean over a long period of time. Uh, I am certainly not one to advocate quitting um, early in the process. Uh, I've had to develop a great sense of perseverance in my life and career because my chosen uh, field of work is one that is very difficult to make it in. So I've had to just stick to it and stick to it and stick to it. So I am by no means suggesting that you bail out at the first sign of resistance. But if you've done something for a long period of time, you've kept at it and kept at it and kept at it and kept at it, and it just begins to become clear to you that momentum just isn't happening. Critical mass just isn't forming. It is not um, it's, it's not getting on the rails and riding. It, it's just not happening. Um, that lack of momentum might be a sign uh, that it's time to move on and try something else. So watch for unanimity and agreement. Next, watch for the voice of experience. Again, let's look at verse 11. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, I love this. The elders, the old goats, the old dudes. These are the people with experience. Um, why is experience so important? <laughs> well, because when you have experience, you know what the heck 
you're doing. <laughs> One of the hardest things to do in life is to um, get your start when you have no experience. Can I get an amen? Remember, um, if you're my age or older, um, remember getting out of university and looking for your first job? Uh, it's not that easy, I mean, unless you're a dentist, uh, but then you have to set up your practice. I mean, it's just not easy. You think you work hard in high school, you go to university, you're going to graduate and land in the perfect job that will become the perfect career that will help you build the perfect life. Uh, one of the hardest things to do in life is to get your start when you have no experience. Um, the case for me, uh, I had a wonderful and still have a wonderful mother-in-law who is an HR professional. I'll never forget her saying to me, just get any job because it's easier to get a job when you have a job. So <laughs> I just went out and got a job selling cars because I love cars and I can sell and I like people. And so I sold Nissans for a little while. And I think it was six months later I landed my first ministry gig. So if you are looking to get your start, whether it's in a specific career or in a, just a new phase, a new chapter in your life, and you don't really have much tangible experience, the answer, and this is a good one, is to find some elders and piggyback on their experience. Do you like that? Piggyback on someone else's experience. Find somebody who has experience in the field that you're looking to get into and just piggyback on them. Um, I could talk about this at length um, in person or in an interview when it comes to being a television producer or being a preaching pastor, um, but I want to use a better example that's uh, simpler and quicker. Football coach. Um, I consider it almost a third career. No, I'm not getting paid to coach, but I take it um, seriously uh, to the point that I might as well be getting paid to do what I do. I coach my son's football team uh, in the league in our town, which is one of the most prestigious leagues in the entire country. And it all started out um, when my eldest boy uh, began playing years ago. I think it's got to be five years ago now, uh, maybe more, maybe five years, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, five years ago. When he started, I was just an interested dad. I played football in high school, I played it in university, it's my favorite sport, uh, that and sailing and chasing my wife. Um, she's probably my first favorite sport. Um, but I was that dad on the sideline watching my son play, and I was really engaged, really interested, really involved. So that was my first year. I was the interested dad. And I tried a couple times to get involved, but I kind of hit a brick wall with his coaches, and so I just remained that interesting dad. Year two, I became the annoying dad, because um, I knew the league a little better. I knew the parents. I knew the coaches. I felt a little more comfortable. So I became that crazy dad who stalks the sideline screaming. <laughs> And not only would I scream at my own son, I began screaming at the other sons, um, telling them what to do. Now, like I said, I have a long history in football. I know what I'm talking about. So I became that annoying dad, uh, shouting imprecations to the young boys uh, as they uh, did their best to uh, fumble their way through the play. It was so bad that my wife said to me, look, you've got to do something about this. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> so I went to my son's uh, coach, and I said, look, if you ever need any help, I'm dying over here. I would love to help. And so long story short, he allowed me to become one of his assistant coaches in year three. And that year, I was uh, started out as the linebackers coach and quickly moved up to becoming the defensive coordinator, and we had a great year. And I made enough of an impression in year three that in year four, the league asked me to be a head coach. And so year four, I was the head coach of my own team, and I had zero head coaching experience. And that first year of head coaching was extremely stressful. I found it really tough. Um, really hard. At, at points I wanted to quit. Why? Because I had no experience. But we made it through. And then last year, year five, I was the head coach and I'd been able to assemble an incredibly dynamic uh, coaching staff and we went on to win the league championship. And this year, going into year six, we just can't wait to get at it because we have five years of experience under our belt and this has put us in a place where we're just stoked about the upcoming football season. This is going to be the same process in anything that you look to do with your life. So if you're just starting out, just accept the fact that it's going to take years. Um, brace yourself. Determine not to become discouraged and just keep at it. So if you're looking to cultivate that breakthrough moment of a good surprise, second point, piggyback on someone else's experience. Next, point number three. Remember who's in charge and that you are his partner. Again, in verse 11, and all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses, the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. The Lord make the woman. This is the, the really key phrase here. The Lord make the woman. Who's the craftsman? Who's the one who's doing the making? Well, God is. The Lord make. Who is the material or who is the agency through whom God is doing his work? Well, Ruth is the Lord make 
the woman. Here's the point. This is really important. God works through you. I'll say it again. God works through you. That is a healthy, uh, a balanced view of life. Uh, put it this way. God's in charge. I'm his partner. Okay? Just embed that in your mind. Write it down. Memorize it. Take it with you this week as you spend your week. God's in charge. I'm his partner. Don't say but. Like God's in charge, but I'm his partner. That um, unbalances it, in my view. God's in charge. I'm his partner. Keep that in mind while watching for your surprise moment. That's, I think, my favorite point in this whole sermon. Uh, next, number four. Look back to move forward. Verse 11. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. Um, they're referring here to the two infamous bickering wives of Jacob, the eventual mothers of the twelve tribes of Israel. Um, what they're doing here is they're keeping their history in mind. So it's very good for us to just apply that point to our lives, to remember our history, to remember to look back in order to move forward. On the surface here, this is a very simple wish or a blessing for many children. May the Lord make your wife like those wives who had 12 kids. Um, it's a very kind of generic sort of best wishes, hey, we hope you have tons of kids. But because this is the Bible, um, we know there are many layers and nuances that lie here beneath the surface. I know this for sure because I preached extensively through the lives of the patriarchs a couple years back at my church. Um, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks exploring the lives of these patriarchs. And I can tell you this by way of just first introduction to those layers and nuances. Jacob was messed up, okay, tremendously messed up. Usurper was one of his nicknames. Uh, his wives were messed up. And, here's the point, God worked out his sovereign plan through those broken people. And uh, the Bible exists to illustrate these people's lives, to illustrate the fact that God worked through their lives to make the following point. He will do the same for you. <laughs> you should smile. You should sigh a huge sigh of relief. He will do the same for you. Thank God. Amen. Let it be so. So look back to move forward. Next. While watching for and working to cultivate your breakthrough moment of surprise, number five, make a name for yourself. Let's uh, look again at verse 11. And may you prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Uh, the word for prosper here, I referred to it last week, the same word appeared last week. Prosper is the word chayel in uh, Hebrew, um, which in modern Hebrew is chayal, which means soldier. Uh, may you be soldierly in Ephrata. If you were to put that in today's vernacular, it's uh, may you be the man. Ephrata was their province. May you be the man in our province. Uh, and may you be famous in Bethlehem. The word for famous there has to do with his name. May your name become known around town. So in today's vernacular, they would have been saying here, may you become the man in our province and may your name become known around town. Um, I want to say this from Scripture, okay? It's a, it's a broad-based theme in Scripture. Uh, hear me. Good things come to those who do good things. <laughs> right? You can put that on a t-shirt. Good things come to those who do good things. I'm paraphrasing uh, Matthew 13, verse 12, so you can go and look it up for yourself. But trust me when I say, good things come to those who do good things. So the point is this, okay? Hear me. Build your life while waiting for your ship to come in. Build your life while you're waiting for that breakthrough moment. Um, using the imagery of the ship coming in, imagine somebody just down at the wharf waiting and 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 waiting. And waiting. You get the point. For years for their ship to come in. Okay, it's true. Um, you may be waiting for that big breakthrough. I can certainly identify. There have been moments throughout my life when I've had to wait for a, a breakthrough moment that I can't make happen, um, and I know when, it's, when it happens, it's going to take things to the next level. I'm there again in my career, and I've been doing this for basically 20 years. But if you were to just stand on that wharf for years and do nothing and just watch the horizon, what do you think would happen with your life? Not much. Okay, so build your life while you're waiting for the ship, for your ship to come in. Uh, in other words, put another way, make a name for yourself. It's beautiful, okay? It's a biblical principle. May your name become known around town. While you're waiting for that breakthrough moment, do your best to work as hard as you can to make a name for yourself in your local context. And finally, number six, prepare to be 
surprised. Here we finally transition to verse 12. May your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Prepare to be surprised. Why surprised? Well, the story of Peretz is a very surprising one. Uh, it's drawn from Genesis chapter 38. They would have known this story. It was famous uh, in their day. You might not know it. I'm not going to take the time to read the entire chapter, but instead I'll just give you the kind of the high points of the story of uh, Judah, Tamar, and uh, Peretz. Who's Judah? He's the son of Jacob, okay? One of the 12 sons, one of Joseph's older brothers. Um, Genesis 38 is basically setting up the story of Joseph. It takes a detour to tell you in Genesis 38 the story of Judah. Um, it talks about the kids he had. His firstborn son uh, was named Er, E-R. And um, when Er grows up, it's time for him to get married. And so Judah finds a girl for his son Er uh, to marry. This girl's name is Tamar. And she marries him and all is well. Uh, one problem, Er is so wicked that God kills him. <laughs> I love the Bible. It's such a weird document, right? It's just a throwaway sentence. Er was so wicked that God killed him, right? You could make a teachable point. Don't mess with God or he'll kill you. Um, <laughs> it's provocative, I know. Er is so wicked that God kills him. Um, it's a problem. Tamar is now a widow, which uh, you know from listening to this series is not a good thing in Bible times. It's not a good thing in our time. Um, so Judah tells Onan, his uh, second son, to uh, do his duty and to uh, sleep with Tamar to give her a son so that his brother Judah's uh, name will um, survive in Israel. So Onan um, at least starts out right. Now if you have kids watching this, this is where the sermon gets x-rated, just for a minute. Um, I know some of my listeners have their kids sit down and watch with them on Sundays. My daughter's here listening as I shoot this. She's doing audio today, so it's, it's not that bad. But uh, it's in the Bible, so I'm just going to tell it like it is. So Onan goes in to have sex with his sister-in-law, and he does. But right at the moment of climax, he withdraws, and he ejaculates on the ground. And uh, from this, in modern Hebrew, we get the term le'onen, to basta onen, to do what onen did, to masturbate. So the word for masturbate in Hebrew is literally, to this day, le'onen, <laughs> to bust an onen, to do what that bonehead did, uh, pulled out and denied his uh, sister-in-law. Uh, the offspring that would have been the key to her uh, surviving with a life of any kind of fruitfulness. Um, God is so mad about this <laughs> that he kills Onan. <laughs> so um, you've been warned. Um, <laughs> so what happens next? Judah, uh, she just had her, my daughter was closing her ears. Close your ears, baby. Earmuffs. Um, so Judah says, listen, tomorrow." Things haven't gone exactly as planned. Um, I'd like you to wait until Shelah, my third son, grows up. And when he grows up, you can marry him. So Tamar waits. She does the right thing. She um, just enters into widowhood, and she waits for Shelah to grow up. And then the story fast forwards a little bit. We get to the stage where Shelah has grown up, and Tamar notices that uh, no marriage is forthcoming. So she decides to take matters into her own hands. Here's the story. It gets really interesting. Um, Judah is on a trip like a business trip in our day of the world, and uh, she poses as a prostitute, and she entices Judah to um, sleep with her. And he's willing to sleep with her. Um, she must have been uh, a beautiful woman. Uh, and just as they're about to uh, do the deed, she demands payment, as any good prostitute would. And she says to him, how are you going to pay me? And he says, well, how about a goat? Will a goat do? And she's like, yeah, a goat will do. Okay, good. Well, how will I know you're going to give me the goat? I need some kind of, you know, um, assurance that you're actually going to deliver. So uh, he ends up giving her his signet, his uh, cord, and his staff. These are kind of um, items that he would have carried on his person, his signet, like a signet ring, uh, instead of signing a signature, uh, a cord that he would have worn to bind his clothing to himself, and his staff. These are signature items that belong to him. So she, she demands these as a pledge. She's like, okay, look, I'll give you these in the meantime, and then when I do send the goat, you can give him my stuff back. So, good, she's satisfied, they have sex. Uh, in the biblical account, it says that he impregnates her. Of course, they wouldn't have known that at the time. But uh, they have their tumble, and uh, he moves on. He uh, sends the goat to the young woman, and the young woman is nowhere to be found. He's upset about this. His servant's like, boss, the girl's gone, we can't find her. And so, it's a bit of a mystery. Three months later, the story really gets cool. Uh, his servants show up to him and scream to Judah that his daughter-in-law, that filthy hussy Tamar, is pregnant and she's not even married. Uh, this is a scandal. And uh, they're going to burn her alive. <laughs> so uh, 
that's when Genesis 38, verse 25 happens. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. You can imagine this is a bum 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 moment for Judah. And uh, he does the right thing. He says, my bad. My bad, yeah, I did it. And uh, takes responsibility, never sleeps with her again. And uh, she ends up having twins. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Uh, the twins she had, as the baby's being born, the first one, they tie a scarlet um, string around his hand. The hand kind of came out, uh, and they tie it around his hand to s signify this is the firstborn. The hand then goes back in, and then the baby that is actually born is not the baby around whose wrist they've tied the scarlet ring, so the, the scarlet uh, thread. So the second born actually busted his way out in place of the firstborn. And Peretz's name is actually um, busted out. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that the brother came out unexpectedly and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Peretz. Um, so Peretz literally means to break out, bust it out. Um, and so this kid was named essentially Surprise because he was a surprise. He wasn't supposed to come out first, he was supposed to come out second, but he busted his way out. His name was Surprise, Surprise. Now there's a very, so that's why uh, the story of Peretz, his mom Tamar, and Judah is relevant. It's a very interesting connection to the story of Ruth. Again, the story of Tamar had to do with a kinsman redeemer. The story didn't really go as it was meant to go. Uh, the story of Ruth, again, about a kinsman redeemer, a widow who needs a husband, needs an heir, and this time the story turns out a little better. They don't require the kind of shenanigans we see in Genesis chapter 38. There's a very good chance that your life isn't anywhere near as desperate as Tamar's life was or anywhere near as desperate as Ruth's life was. Um, even so, God is going to surprise you with his goodness. So sometimes when we read the Bible, we feel a little bad because as you know, your average run-of-the-mill run Westerners, um, our life just isn't that exciting. We're not sleeping with our father-in-law. Um, God's not striking our husband dead because they're wicked, even though sometimes we might wish that he would at least give them a little slap on the side of the head. You might live a normal average life. Okay, you don't have to have a crazy life like these women for God to intervene. God is going to surprise you with his goodness. It's nice to have the contrast of the really crazy story of Tamar and the not-so-crazy story of Ruth. Okay, God is going to intervene in your life. He's going to surprise you with his goodness. And especially if you're watching this and um, your life really is desperate. It's a big, bad world out there, and uh, you really identify with the desperate situation that these women found themselves in. Um, if that's you, God is going to surprise you with his goodness. So either way, crazy life or not so crazy life, get ready. Okay? Watch for unanimity, agreement, and momentum. Piggyback on uh, someone else's experience till you get enough of your own. Remember that God is, in, is uh, in charge and you're his partner. Look back to move forward. Make a name for yourself in the meantime. And most of all, prepare to be surprised.